you and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We thank you for coming tonight to hear what the Bible has to say on this subject. And we hope tonight just to scratch the surface a little bit, to maybe generate a bit of interest so that you can look into the things of the Bible a little further. Because over the years, many people have doubted the accuracy of the Bible, have doubted the veracity of the Bible, if it can actually be trusted, if it can be trusted over such a long period of time. When I guess you'd say in 2013 they didn't have electronic storage to make sure that it was kept accurate. Could they trust that it was actually the word of God, that these people, these places, were actually there? But what you find when you look at the Bible is that it can be. And it doesn't matter if you look at nature, if you look at prophecy, if you look at the laws of the Bible, or if you look at archaeology. It all goes to prove that the Bible itself can be trusted. That the Bible is a book that is true and that has stood the test of time from the time that it was written. What I hope to do this evening is look at a very few instances where archaeology can be shown to confirm the Bible. It can confirm the accuracy of the Bible. The Bible that's made up of 66 books that go to make one book, the Bible. So let's have a very quick look to start with at the claims of the Bible. When you look at it, it says, Holy Bible. It's a separate book in which God has recorded his will and his purpose with mankind. And it outlines to those who are prepared to read it the way in which men are to worship God in a manner that is acceptable to him. And it gives men a hope beyond this current life, beyond this current order of things, a hope of life eternal on the earth. As we said, it's a collection of 66 books which have been collated into one book with two broad divisions, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament, obviously, is the period leading up to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the New Testament was written in the time after that by the apostles. The Old Testament, we find, was started to be written by Moses about 1,600 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was completed by Malachi about 1,200 years later, or 400 years before the birth of Christ. While the New Testament was written in the lifetime of the apostles and completed in AD 96 by John on the Isle of Patmos when he wrote Revelation. But despite the fact that the Bible is written over about 1,700 years, it still has one consistent message. And there's a very good reason why we have that one consistent message. And that's told for us in 1 Peter 1 and verse 21, where we read, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What it's telling us is that it wasn't the writings of men that are recorded in this book for us, but rather it's the writings of Almighty God. He caused men to write those things that he wanted written, that he wanted recorded, so that there would be the one consistent message. Those who recorded these words were from many different countries, different classes of society, they were fishermen, Kings, military men, shepherds, but they all gave themselves willingly to write what God wanted. So that we have today the Word of God. It has nearly 3,000 characters in it, in 1,500 different places, and as we said, over 1,700 years. But it was written by the power and inspiration of God, so that it had one consistent message from one end of the Scripture to the other. As I said, we're going to scratch the surface this evening. And I've chosen a few things from the Old Testament that can show us that the Bible is accurate and reliable. But we could look at other things, things that are outside of the land of Israel. You look at the, um, the flood, which is recorded in the Bible. And many of the, I guess, ancient people, the Aboriginals, I'm not sure about them, maybe the Indians or whoever it may be, have records of the flood. Yes, 
I guess you'd say they're a paganised version of that. But they have records of a flood that went over the earth that are basically in line with what the scripture has to say. But I guess one of the questions we need to resolve to start with is how can we be sure of the accuracy of the Bible and what has been written there? It was written between 2,000 and 4,000 years ago, wasn't it? Depending on which portion of uh, scripture we're dealing with. And surely the argument might go that over that period of time, well, how can you be sure how accurate it is? And if I was copying it down, I'm sure my dad would tell you that that would be the case. But I wasn't. You see, in 1947, this all changed and this argument really disappeared. And what we'll see is that God had made sure over the period of time that the Bible was preserved. That it was preserved accurately. That its authenticity was not compromised. You see, prior to 1947, we had the Masoretic Scrolls. And these were written in about AD 500 to 900. And these were written by people who were very zealous for the Scriptures. They'd copy them out word for word. They would make sure that they were exact. And what you find is that if there was a spelling error, or so many of them, or the punctuation was wrong, or whatever it may have been, they were discarded. They were put in a box, which was for, I guess, less accurate scrolls, and they had to start again. They had tests to see that it was correct. They counted the number of times a letter of the alphabet occurred in each book. They pointed to the middle verse, word and letter of the whole Hebrew Bible, um, I guess Genesis to Malachi. They pointed to the middle letter of the Pentateuch, Genesis to Deuteronomy. They counted the total number of verses, words and letters. They were extremely diligent in what they were did, did to make sure that it was copied correct. And they standardised and edited the text to ensure that they were correct. I oh, know I wouldn't stand the test of that. They were very, very diligent people in what they did in copying it down. But still, when you look at it, scrolls from 500 AD to 900 AD, it's quite a time after Malachi, isn't it? 400 under that, 900 to 1300 years. What they actually did is, uh, once they'd written a scroll, they'd get rid of the old one. Because so confident were they in their copying that they said the newer one was accurate than the old one. So the other one will be put away and they'll be taken off to a synagogue somewhere or something like that and used and obviously get worn out. So the new one would be there. And that's why there was, you know, the, uh, 1800 to 900 was the oldest scrolls that were found. But this all changed in 1947, as I mentioned. And there was an Arab boy who was looking after his sheep and they disappeared. Down. And understand he threw a stone into a cave that he saw on the side of the shores of the Dead Sea, and something smashed, so he went in to uh, investigate. And what he found, I guess they were a bit bigger than this, was things like this. Little pottery things, um, vases, and inside were scrolls. And, I don't know, this one says on it, um, a manual of discipline. And the scrolls, obviously, were written in Hebrew, Something like that. You can have a look at it afterwards, but please don't touch uh, too much or you'll have to deal with my mother. Um, she wouldn't want it destroyed, and nor would we. But anyway, they found these scrolls in the, these caves. And what was ultimately found in those scrolls was scrolls that were 1,100 years older than the ones that had been previously found. There's another one of the Masoretic Scrolls um, that was found. And the Dead Sea Scrolls. So they're found in the area of the Dead Sea, which you can see down here. You can see one of the caves in the side of the hill there. And I guess some of the bits and pieces that were found in the caves there. Um, something similar to the pot there. <coughs> so these were 1,100 years older than the previous ones that, we'd found, that, that had been found. And what a comparison of them showed 
was that they were very accurate when compared with what was there before. In one cave, they found five books, uh, five copies of the book of Genesis. There was 11 caves in all where they found the, um, the various scrolls. In one cave, they found five copies of the book of Genesis, eight of Exodus, one of Leviticus, 14 of Deuteronomy, two of Joshua, three of Samuel, 12 of Isaiah, four of Jeremiah, and eight of the minor prophets, one of Proverbs and three of Daniel. They were discovered, as I said, in 11 caves between 1947 and 1956, and it would have to be the greatest manuscript discovery of modern times. Cave 1 and 11 produced relatively intact manuscripts, and Cave 4, the largest find, 15,000 fragments in Cave 4, with over 500 manuscripts represented among them. And the scrolls were divided into two categories. There was the biblical scrolls, basically what we have in our Bible here, um, from Genesis to Malachi, with the exception of Ruth, I think it is, exception of Esther, sorry, and non-biblical scrolls. And there was fabric, uh, fab fragments of every book of the Hebrew canon, the Old Testament. Uh, there, there's also additionally there's been discovered 19 copies of the book of Isaiah, 25 of Deuteronomy and 30 of Psalms. They also found prophecies of Ezekiel, Jeremiah and Daniel not found in the Bible. What does that show? Well, yes, Isaiah, Jeremiah and Daniel are mentioned in the scriptures, but there they are, independently verified by something outside of the Bible, that they existed. The Isaiah scroll was a thousand years older than anything previously found. It was also found never seen psalms before, attributed to King David and to Joshua. And what they say is they appear to be a library of a Jewish sect, and it was hidden away in the caves just before the outbreak of the first Jewish re uh, revolt in AD 66 to 70. No doubt, as the Romans were in, uh, advancing on the city of Jerusalem. We also have the last words of Joseph, Judah, Levi, Naphtali, and Amram, the father of Moses, written down in those scrolls. Yes, they're the last words of those people, but what does it do? It verifies that those people actually existed outside of what is recorded in the scriptures. There was another scroll, a copper scroll, that was discovered in one of the caves, and it listed 64 places throughout the land where they deposited other amounts of gold, silver, aromatic, and other manuscripts. And they say they were hidden away for safekeeping from, obviously, the invading Romans. The longest scroll found was found in Cave 11, it was 8.14 metres long, and they believe that it probably would have been about nearly nine metres long when it was started. There's other stories of Enoch, Abraham, Noah. Basically, they are on animal skins, but also papyrus and copper, written with a carbon-based ink, with no punctuation, except for the occasional paragraph indentation. And interestingly enough, there's a few of them, another picture of it. A couple of them actually um, were offered for sale in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal in 1954. I thought that was interesting. You can imagine that happening today. But they're interesting facts about it, aren't they? But what did it actually show? Well, what it showed is that between 8900 and 1000 years previous to that, the scriptures that had been recorded had not changed. Yes, as they'd been recorded down, they'd been recorded with great diligence to make sure that they were accurate. And what they actually say is between the Masoretic Scrolls and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was with a thousand years of difference, there's about 5% variation between what's there. And these mainly consist of slips of the pen, variations in spelling, colour and colour as we have it, <coughs> The Dead Sea Scroll uh, showed that the Masoretic text could be relied upon. And as a result, what we have on our lap here today can also be relied upon to be the accurate Word of God as originally recorded. You see, God in his wisdom ensured that his Word was accurately recorded and kept throughout time. 
He ensured that men who had copied the Bible were particular about its accuracy. And they ensured that the Bible was not compromised in any way. You see, we shouldn't be surprised at this, should we? Because if we read the Bible, we can find occasions when this occurred. Turn over the page to 2 Chronicles 34. And we have the case of Josiah, who was a righteous king. And in his time, what we find is that the scroll of the law had been lost, and it was found again. Verse 14 to 16, we read, And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book of the law to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king word again, saying, All that was committed to thy servant, uh, to thy servants, they do it. You see, what I'm trying to illustrate here is if we go back before we come to Manasseh, who was one of the most evil kings there was, he went out of his way to destroy the worship of God. And if he'd found that scroll, I have no doubt that he would have destroyed it. But God in his wisdom saw that that scroll was maintained, that it was lost so it could be found again by somebody who was going to look and read and do what was written therein. And in a similar way, God has ensured that the Bible as we have it today is, has been recorded accurately down through time. You see, if we look at what the Bible has to say, of that which is written. We're told all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. By ensuring that the Bible is accurate today, for us, those words still stand. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that we may be furnished unto all good works. Well, having briefly looked at the Dead Sea Scrolls, let's have a look at some of the other archaeological finds that there has been in the land of Israel and in around that region or related to that region. In our reading this evening, we had the uh, story of Hezekiah written to us. Um, sorry, read to us. Hezekiah was a faithful king who did that which was right in the sight of Almighty God. He endeavoured to please God in all that he did. And God helped him when as far as the natural eye is concerned, all seemed lost. When he was shut in, up in Jerusalem by a far mightier king than him, with a far mightier army, army with a far larger army, God helped him and delivered him. If we read the full record of the life of Hezekiah, we find that he commenced his reign by cleansing the land of the pagan idols and the ways that had been put in to the land by the kings prior to him. He endeavoured to turn the heart of the people back to God and to educate them in the ways of Almighty God. And if we read 2 Kings 18, verse 3 to 7, we, we find what this king did. We read, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Neheshtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him all, uh, among all the kings of Judah nor any that were before him. And he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. See, during the reign of Hezekiah, the Assyrian was the dominant power. I guess you'd say it was the superpower of the time. And that, um, that nation came against the northern kingdom of Israel and set a siege against Samaria and eventually overthrew the nation. 
carting those that were left off after the siege into captivity. And this, the Bible tells us, occurred in the fourth year of Hezekiah. But around ten years later, in the fourteenth year of the reign of Hezekiah, we find that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came against the fenced cities of Judah, and he took them. We find that Hezekiah had not sat on his hands during this time. He rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. He repaired the walls. He provided a water source. He set his people up with captains of war over them. And Hezekiah bought time from the king of Assyria by agreeing to pay tribute to him to keep them away for a period. We have this recorded for us in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 1 to 6. If you turn back a few pages, please. 2 Chronicles 32, verse 1 to 6. And we read that after these things and the establishment <laughs> thereof, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered into Judah and encamped against the fenced cities and thought to win them for himself. And Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come and that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem. He took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city, and they did help him. So there was gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? Also he strengthened himself and built up all the wall that was broken, and raised it up to the towers and another wall without, and repaired below to the city of David, and made darts and shields in abundance. And he set captains of war over the people, and gathered them together to him in the street of the gate of the city, and spake comfortably unto them. So he started to prepare the city for the time when this king, Assyria, the king of Assyria, would come against him. And if you go on to verse 30 of the same chapter, chapter 32, we read, Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness, behold, they are written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, and in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Sorry, I read verse 32, I wanted verse 30. This same Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of Gihon and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David. And Hezekiah prospered in all his works. <laughs> So we find that during the time available to him, Hezekiah built that aqueduct, an aqueduct that came from out of the city, under the wall, into Jerusalem, so that they would have water to drink in the time of siege. And also so that the king of Assyria, when he came, I guess he wouldn't have water. He'd have to go and find it somewhere else. He told that he gathered the people together to stop the foundations of water that were outside the city, and he dug an aqueduct under the wall to deliver water. And if you go to Jerusalem today, I haven't been there, but I'm told you can go and walk through it, or maybe not today, but you could at one stage, Hezekiah's Tunnel. But what, we f what you find, if you look a bit further, is an inscription. That's the inscription there up the top. Uh, that's where it was carved out of the wall down the bottom there. Uh, when the Turks had the land, they found the inscription, so they carved it out and took it back to a museum in Turkey somewhere. And um, I guess that's part of Hezekiah's tunnel over there that took the water in. But if you can interpret the, um, if you interpret the inscription up there, you find that this is what it says. Obviously, there's bits missing, so that's what we get. The piercing, and this is the history of the digging. When the pickaxes one against the other, and when there are only three cubits more to cut through, the men were heard calling from one side to the other, for there was Zedar in the rock, and on the right and on the left, and on the day of the piercing, the workmen struck each to meet the other, pickaxe against pickaxe, and there flowed the waters from the spring of the pool for a space of 200 cubits. I think it's actually meant to be 1,200 cubits. And 100 cubits was the height above the head of the workmen. So they dug an aqueduct. It was 1,200 cubits long from memory. That's what it should have been. And it was a hundred cubits above their head to the ground above them. And the water flowed into Jerusalem through that aqueduct. So that when Sennacherib, or the king of Assyria, came against Jerusalem, they had water within that city. What we find, though, is that Hezekiah, at this time, paid tribute to Sennacherib. But that didn't go on forever. 
He revolted against the Assyrians. And the Assyrians responded by coming down and taking the cities of Judah. One by one, he worked his way. Sennacherib worked his way through the cities of Jerusalem. Judah, taking one fenced city after another. And we find, as we said, that Hezekiah bought some time by paying tribute to the king of Assyria. But what we find is that what occurred at this time is recorded in history. On that stone there, called the Taylor Prison, I think probably after the person who found it. But it's a record of the eight of eight expeditions of Sennacherib, and you've got them listed there. You can read them if you want. And number three, an invasion of Judah and siege of Jerusalem is recorded on this here. And this is a relevant bit. It's probably a bit hard to read there, but I'll read it for you. As for Hezekiah the Judite, who did not submit to my yoke, forty-six of his strong walled cities, as well as the small towns in their area which were without number, by levelling with battering rams and by bringing up siege engines and by attacking and storming on foot by mines, tunnels and breaches, I besieged and took them, 200,150 people, great and small, male and female, horses, mules, asses, camels, cattle and sheep, without number. I bought away from them and counted as spoil. Hezekiah himself, like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem his royal city. I threw up earthworks against him. The one coming out of the city gate, I turned back to his misery. His cities which I despoiled, I cut off from his land. And to Mitinitai, king of Ashdod, Paddy, king of es- uh, Ekron, and Silibel, king of Gaza, I gave them. And thus I diminished his land, I added to the former tribute, and I laid upon him the surrender of their land and impos. Gifts for my majesty. As for Hezekiah, the terrifying splendour of my majesty overcame him. And the Arabs and his mercenary troops, which he had brought to strengthen Jerusalem, his royal city, deserted him. In addition to 30 talents of gold and 800 talents of silver, gems, antimony, jewels, large (coughs) greens, ivory inlaid couches and so forth, um, was the tribute that he put on him. To pay tribute and accept servitude, he dispatched his messengers. So what we're told there is that Sennacherib came against Jerusalem and besieged it. And Hezekiah sued for peace, I guess you'd say, with him. And he accepted the tribute that was put on him. What does the Bible have to say? 2 Kings 18 and verse 3. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. What did this stone tell us? Right at the start. As for Hezekiah the Judite, who did not submit to my yoke, 46 of his strong walled cities, as well as the small towns in their area, which were without number, he took them, he levelled them, he took the people captive. And as we said before, Hezekiah would seem, or he went and he paid tribute to the king of Assyria, as we have written in this here. And we have that also recorded for us in 2 Kings 18, verse 14 to 16, where we're told that Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended, return from me that which thou puttest on me, I will, will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed appointed under Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. At that time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. So you see, we had recorded back here, didn't we? Um... Two thirds of the way down. In addition to the 30 talents of gold and 800 talents of silver, gems and so forth, was a tribute that was put upon him. Yes, in here we have it once again. It was 30 talents of um, gold and uh, 300 
counts of silver, I think, from memory. Yes, there's a discrepancy, but basically the story is correct. But it goes further than this. You see, what the scripture tells us is what was going to happen to the king of Assyria. You see, the king of Assyria was not going to come into that city, nor was his army. And uh, Sennacherib, in his engravings, in his carvings, never said he took Jerusalem. Never said he entered that city. And what we find is that the angel of God went out one night after Hezekiah had pleaded to God for assistance and destroyed 185,000 men of the army of the king of Assyria, King Sennacherib. We find that after that, Sennacherib went home, back to Nineveh. Isaiah 37, verse 33 to 38, tells us what happened. And Isaiah the prophet said to Hezekiah, Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it, for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. And then the angel of the Lord went forth, and smote the camp of the Assyrians, and hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they are all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of Nishroch his god, that Adramelech and Shereza his son smote him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Ezar Haddon his son reigned in his stead. So what we told is that Sennacherib would not come into that city. His army would not come into that city. Sennacherib does not claim to have taken that city. He took 46 of the fenced cities according to what he'd written and met of the unfenced cities. But we told that he went back to his land and he was killed when he was worshipping his God. What we find is that Sennacherib had set up his headquarters at Lachish and he sent his army and um, Rabshakeh and so forth down to Jerusalem to siege it, to take it. And Rabshakeh made threats against the um, city of Jerusalem. And also threats against the God of that city, or made comments about the God of that city. And when Hezekiah took those things before Almighty God, God gave him those word of com words of comfort then. Verse 35, I will defend this city and save it. And his angel went forth and slew them. But look in verse 38 then, we are told what happened to Sennacherib when he went back home, and went in before his God and worshipped his God of stone. And it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of Nishroch his god, that Adramelech and Shereza his son smote him with the sword, and they escaped in the, into the land of Armenia, and Ezar Hadad reigned in his stead. Well, what we find is in the chronicles of Ezar Hadad, the following recorded. In the month Nishanyu, on a favourable day, complying with their exalted command, I made my joyful entrance into the royal palace, an awesome place, you get the feeling that these uh, kings didn't mind saying how good they were and how much they'd done. Wherein abides the fate of kings, a firm determination fell upon my brothers. They forsook the gods and turned their deeds of violence, plotting evil. To gain the kingship, they slew Sennacherib their father in the month uh, Nishanyu on a favourable day. Complying with their exalted command, I made my joyful entrance into the royal palace and awesome place, wherein abides the fates of kings. A firm, and I've copied it twice there, a little bit. No, a firm determination fell on my brothers. I think I've copied that down twice. <laughs> so down the bottom, to gain the kingship, they slew Sennacherib their father. So the, the, the sons of Sennacherib went in and slew their father while he was worshipping his own God. What did Isaiah 37 say? As he was worshipping in the house of Nishrok his God, his son slew him, and Ezar Hadon reigned in his stead. That's exactly what we find occurred. 
You see, what has happened once again is the words of the Bible have been vindicated. The words of the Bible have been shown to be correct. The doubters, who probably said at one stage that these people never existed, were shown to be once again wrong. Well, let's have a quick look at one other, the Moabite stone. There it is, the Moabite stone. And the person who found this, um, I think he had some Arabs with him, or the people from the area with him at the time, and he, thankfully he made a plaster cast of it, because when he left, um, the Arabs decided to smash it up, which is why there's three main pieces there, and then sell it off. And it's been put back together, similar to that there. But the interesting thing about the Moabite stone is that it is the oldest record, the oldest place where the, you know, the God of the Bible is recorded, the words Yahweh, or YHWH as it is. It also records the name of the king of Israel by the name of Omri, and Mesha, king of Moab. Yes, that's basically all that's on it, as far as the Bible is concerned. But what we find is, bit by bit, the things of the Bible are shown that archaeology is in agreement with them. That the things that they find prove the Bible. They show that the Bible is correct. You can read the inscription there. But it talks about Omri and um, Mesha, who was the king of Moab, and Omri, who was the king of Israel. And these two men are, ki are kings that are found in the scripture. 2 Kings 3, verse 4 and 5. We have the record of Mesha, king of Moab, who was a sheep master and rendered unto the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs, and so forth. And it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against Israel, uh, the king of Israel. So we have Mesha there, who was referred to in the Moabite stone. Second, the first of Kings 16, verse 23. In the thirty and first year of Asa, king of Judah, began Omri to reign over Israel. Twelve years, uh, six years reigned he in Terzah. And so it goes. So we have Omri referred to in the scripture. And we have the fact that this Omri actually existed, verified outside of the Bible by that Moabite stone. You see, what we have is small snippets that the archaeology has dug up, a piece here, a piece there, that slowly does away with the doubters as far as scripture is concerned. While we might say that archaeology proves the Bible, really, the reverse is correct. The Bible, in every aspect, has always been shown to be accurate. They doubted Babylon existed. It was found. No one would doubt that today. The Bible said the earth was round. Men at one stage said it was flat. The Bible was shown to be correct. And on and on the list goes. And I've no doubt that if men picked up the Bible, and rather than digging when they found something, they took the Bible and looked for the place, they probably would have found these places, a lot of these places, a whole lot earlier. Because really, you would have to say that the Bible proves archaeology. I'll see where the two of them are in agreement. Because what has been written in the Bible is the word of God. As I said when we started, tonight I can but touch the surface on this subject. It's a massive subject. There's many books written on it. There's many pages you could look at on the internet about, this, um, about archaeology and how that is in agreement with the Bible. But what I hope I have done is sown a seed to make you want to look at the things of the Bible a little further. Because what the Bible does is holds out for you and I a hope beyond what we see around us, beyond the hopeless situation that we have in the world today. The hope of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth, to establish the kingdom of God on this earth, to establish a time of world peace when all men will desire to do that which is right and proper in the sight of Almighty God. We thank you for your time this evening and we hope that you'll look into the things of the Bible a little further.